West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Well, the stakes could not have been higher in the last presidential election. The rule of law, sanity, democracy itself, to name a few. That is some of what was at stake in this country. But now we know that the very existence of Ukraine was at stake in our last presidential election. And it may be that the life of Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky was at stake in our last presidential election. Jonathan Chait put it this way in New York Magazine today, quote, had 44,000 votes in Georgia, Arizona, and Wisconsin swung the other way, Zelensky would probably, at this moment, be in exile, in a Russian prison, or dead. Is Vladimir Putin evil? Is a question that no one is really struggling with anymore. The affirmative answer to that question has united everyone from Sean Hannity to Sean Penn. Everyone except Donald Trump. Two weeks ago, on the night that Sean Penn appeared on this program, he also appeared on Sean Hannity's show in a remarkable discussion between two people who disagree on everything except Ukraine and Vladimir Putin. In the interview, after Sean Hannity called Vladimir Putin evil, Sean Penn said this. But if there is a God, there will be vengeance beyond all possible comprehension. Donald Trump still cannot bring himself to say anything like that. Donald Trump does not have the moral clarity of Sean Penn or Sean Hannity when it comes to Vladimir Putin. Two days before Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, when Vladimir Putin publicly obtained encouragement and the authorization for an invasion in a truly foolish procedure that was televised, Donald Trump said, quote, there was a television screen and I said, this is genius. Putin declares a big portion of Ukraine, of Ukraine, uh, Putin declares it as independent oh that's wonderful so putin is now saying it's independent a large section of ukraine i said how smart is that the next day in responding to criticism of the putin genius comment donald trump said this trump said putin's smart i mean he's taken over a country for two dollars worth of sanctions i'd say that's pretty smart He's, he's taking over a country that really a vast, vast location, a great piece of land with a lot of people and just walking right in. Today, Vladimir Putin admitted that these sanctions are hurting Russia, saying, quote, the most urgent problem here is the disruption of export logistics. But Donald Trump thought that it was worth 
$2 worth of sanctions. It was $2 worth of sanctions. And Donald Trump said that Vladimir Putin was pretty smart to take those $2 worth of sanctions in exchange for taking over a country, what he called a great piece of land. And Donald Trump believed that Vladimir Putin apparently believed that Russian troops would be, quote, walking right in. Donald Trump had nothing but praise for Vladimir Putin just walking right into Ukraine. Sean Hannity has publicly said he has been friends with Donald Trump for 25 years. And in the Trump White House, Sean Hannity was regarded as the real White House chief of staff, the one who never got fired, the one who had full access to Donald Trump, could give the president advice through the television screen or over the phone whenever he wanted to. And so Sean Hannity would like Donald Trump to be president again, which is one reason that Sean Hannity has been on a dedicated mission to get Donald Trump to say that Vladimir Putin is evil. On March 10th, two full weeks into Vladimir Putin's invasion that was in and of itself a war crime, Sean Hannity tried to guide Donald Trump to, in effect, retract his statements about the invasion being genius and being pretty smart. And after a few minutes of warm-up conversation, Sean Hannity tried to give Donald Trump the perfect setup for finally saying the right thing. The perfect setup wasn't good enough. You came under some fire when you said that Vladimir Putin's very smart. I think I know you a little bit better than most people in the media, and uh, I think you also recognize he's evil, do you not? Well, I was referring to the fact that he said this is an independent nation talking about Ukraine. And I said, that's some said, this is before there was any attack. attack. He's calling it an independent nation. Now, a lot of things are changing. When you look, this doesn't seem to be the same Putin that I was dealing with. You also recognize he's evil, do you not? Well, I was referring to the fact that he said, uh, and he goes on. Minutes later, Sean Hannity tried again from a slightly different angle. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Is that how you viewed Vladimir? Did you view Vladimir Putin and people like President Xi and Kim Jong-un and the Iranian mullahs as enemies that you needed to keep close? I got along with these people. I got along with them well. That doesn't mean they're good people. It doesn't mean uh, anything other than the fact that I understood them and perhaps they understood me. Not only would Donald Trump not call Putin evil that night, but he wouldn't even call him an enemy two weeks into Vladimir Putin's war, two weeks into Vladimir Putin killing babies, killing innocent civilians constantly in Ukraine. Sean Hannity is not giving up on the dream of another Trump presidency, and he apparently has not given up on the dream of getting Donald Trump to look at Vladimir Putin through a moral frame. Sean Hannity tried again last night after 49 days of Vladimir Putin's war, 49 days of Vladimir Putin murdering, murdering now what we know to be hundreds of babies, 49 days of Vladimir Putin targeting hospitals, apartment buildings, trying to murder as many Ukrainian civilians as he possibly can. Weeks after President Biden said Vladimir Putin is guilty of war crimes, and in the same week that President Biden said for the first time that what's happening in Ukraine is genocide, Sean Hannity could not get his friend Donald Trump to use the word evil about Vladimir Putin and what Vladimir Putin is doing in Ukraine. I asked you the last time you were on whether you think that this is evil in our time. Do you believe this is evil in our time? I think in a hundred years, people are going to look back and they're going to say, how did we stand back and NATO stand back, which in many ways I've called a paper tiger. We did not stand back. NATO did not stand back. We are supplying Ukraine with the weapons they are using to survive. Some of those weapons appear to have sunk the most fearsome warship in the Russian fleet. Those weapons have killed Russian soldiers at a higher rate than any Russian combat deaths that we have seen since World War II. Donald Trump reached for those lies 
that the United States and NATO have been standing back. Instead of answering Sean Hannity's clear question, do you believe this is evil in our time? Donald Trump refused to answer that question, and he just rambled, and Sean Hannity could not have given Donald Trump a stronger signal that he needed to answer this question the right way than by pointing out to him that he already asked him this exact question the last time he was on Sean Hannity's show. Sean Hannity is not in the business of surprising Donald Trump with questions on TV. We have every reason to assume that Sean Hannity told Donald Trump directly that he was going to ask him, do you believe this is evil in our time? And perhaps just to remind Donald Trump that he already told him that he was going to ask him this question in the actual interview, he once again told him he was going to ask the question in the interview before he asked the question. He said, I asked you the last time that you were here on whether you think this is evil in our time. Do you believe this is evil in our time? And Donald Trump said nothing. He said a couple hundred words that included NATO, Mercedes-Benz, Volkswagen, NATO becoming rich. He said something really insulting about Chuck Todd, but he did not dare, did not dare to say one insulting word about Vladimir Putin, not one word. It is Friday, the 15th of April of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef, and our daily special is Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Yeah, yes, yes, it's virtual, so don't worry, okay? It's a French 77, very potent, even in the virtual world, so take care. Very tasty, though. One of, well, if not the most balanced cocktail in the history of cocktails. And I don't mention that lightly. Not one whit. Hey, uh, so uh, looks like that giant uh, uh, Russian battleship got sunk. Literally, it's at the bottom of the uh, the ocean, wherever they were towing it. They said that it sunk while they were towing it in a storm. Of course, no one ever finishes the sentence. Yeah, it sunk while they were towing it in a storm of missiles. And I gotta say, if it's a missile, that is rather rare for a missile or missiles to take out a battleship. Also, the... From what is described, or who is described as the beloved captain of that battleship, apparently perished in the attack. So uh, Vladimir Putin is, uh, I don't know, (laughs) does anybody tell him this stuff? Apparently, from one headline I read, is that he's quite livid. He's quite upset. And he must know about it because Russian TV is apocalyptic. How dare they? They suck our beloved battleship. How dare they? Well, you know, (laughs) when you're bombing children in hospitals and schools and theaters and, you know, whatever. Your battleship uh, going to the bottom of the ocean is the least of your concerns. Okay. Saw a little blurb that uh, an unsealed uh, charging document from the DOJ against uh, three Russians who tried to influence a member of Congress with a paid junket. What, on the 4th of July? DOJ didn't name the member of Congress because obviously it's a Republican. If it was a Democratic member of Congress, they would have named him and, and had a perp walk. Because the DOJ doesn't want to be seen as being political. Okay. We don't get to know who the Republican member of Congress is, but the Democratic member of Congress, if it had ever happened, would be perp walked for the world to see. Because we don't want to be political. All right. Well, that's good. Uh, I, I think there is a bunch of junkets being planned for the 4th of July because I think that Vlad considers a celebration in order when he finally uh, blows Ukraine to smithereens. And even if he doesn't, he's going to have the junket uh, party anyway. 
because he has to. Okay. Wow. It's it's unbelievable that we have to modify our behavior to the whims of these oligarch crazy men. And I'm not just talking about Putin. I'm also talking about Elon Musk, the so-called champion of free speech, was under another Afrikaner apartheid lawsuit at Tesla in San Leandro. I already went through one. 137 million. I know it got it got cut down to 10 or so. Maybe it was 16 million, but 137 to 16. I, okay, all right. That was the judge's decision. I, you know, it's still quite a bit of money, I suppose. But uh, apparently, Ellen has to manipulate the stock of Twitter so he can afford to buy it. But I love how the right wing is saying, oh, he's going to bring balance to Twitter. You know what? What he's going to do, he's going to bring back all the harassment, the vile stalking, the swatting of people. You know, that that uh, got cut down way, way down, got way down when Twitter finally took heed. And I think it was because of some lawsuits that occurred from people who died. So Elon Musk wants to bring bro culture back to Twitter because something's missing. Yeah, bro culture is not really missing from Twitter, let's be clear. But Elon Musk needs to make it even more so. And uh, anybody who's still an Afrikaner or apartheid asshole, who is not even an engineer, <laughs> he does not have an engineering degree. He does not. He's not a scientist. I wish people would stop making him out like he is. He inherited wealth from blood emeralds under an apartheid regime. And then he got all all these like kickbacks from the government to do all sorts of stuff he's never delivered. Where's the tunnel? I want the magnetic hypersonic tunnel. Where's that? I know they're sending cargo up to outer space. They even sent a Tesla car to throw into the sun. That's how much money he's got to burn. But let's uh let's uh piss on all the people making about fifty, sixty thousand bucks a year as being slackers and they need to pay more in taxes. What? After all the subsidies you got after you became wealthy from blood emeralds. Don't talk to me about slacking. Oh, he's such a great businessman. Yeah, well, you know, every business I worked for, the first thing they always told me was that business is not a democracy. And Elon Musk is purporting himself to be a businessman, so therefore, by definition, he is against democracy. Don't talk to me about free speech. Doesn't even have it in his Tesla plant. Well, you can't run business like a democracy with free speech. You gotta, you gotta sequester uh, the darkies over there in uh, whatever. They, they have such vile names for where they would segregate people of color. That's what we're talking about here. And then the racist epithets, the racist terminology right to a person of color's face, and they're supposed to take it? And we are supposed to quiver in our boots because Elon Musk is shaking up the stock market. Why don't they throw his ass in jail? He's Ivan Boski, the uh, market right now. And you got to look that guy that up. That's B O E. Okay. Bursky. Bursky. Yeah, some of us remember that. <laughs> Probably all of us do. <laughs> or if we don't necessarily, it's not something that we've been thinking about at the top of our head for quite a few decades. But, uh, you know, since the 80s. But there, I jogged your memory, Ivan Bursky. Yeah. That's right. Hostile takeover. Poison pill this. Aha. Uh -huh. 
Well, it is Good Friday. Did you know it's Good Friday and we had Ash Wednesday and we went right past Ash Wednesday without even acknowledging it? Darn. I used to be a devout Catholic. Now I just have a, I don't know, a nod to it. It's sort of like being in the mafia. Once you're in, you never get out. Yeah. No matter how hard you try. <laughs> anyway, it's Good Friday. We got Easter. Uh, some of us call it Ascension Day. <laughs> Yeah, beat me up, Scotty. (laughs) All right, Jesus, come on up. Okay, and from there, we built a whole religion and uh, get to, I don't know, lord over everybody. That's another thing. Jesus is lording over me too much. Your Jesus is lord is lording over me too much. It is not your Jesus is lord. It's you. (laughs) Jeez. You know, I really thought that there was supposed to be no religious test and the U.S. government is not supposed to, you know, establish any kind of religion. These anti-abortion laws are wholly some sort of wacko extremist Christian ideology being forced upon us by government. Last I looked, that's supposed to be unconstitutional, but I know. I know with Barrett. Oh, Amy... And the others that got packed onto the court by you-know-who. I'm not just talking about Trump. I'm talking about Mitch also. Uh, All of those little niceties matter. Not one whit. Not one whit. All right. Do you think I'm getting chippy? (laughs) Not one whit. Okay, well, let's uh, let's dive into uh, what we have here offered as as a curated part of uh, the salon that we call West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy as we begin in the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy's Bistro Cafe part of this lovely salon and save room. We do have the chef's table to go to at the end for a little amuse-bouche. I know we do it backwards here, but we're Americans. We eat the salad first, the amuse-bouche last. Okay. Yeah, Lawrence laid it out that Trump still cannot bring himself to say Putin is evil. Now, I got to tell you, in terms of intellectual fortitude or rectitude, I have a hard time with the idea of evil, okay? It's wholly a human construct, I believe. But if there is evil in the world, Vladimir Putin is, okay? It's easy. It's easy to say. Look what he does. Killing babies in maternity wards. My God. On the rest of the menu, the office of the uh, of the Virginia Attorney General Denied it gave a pedophile cop a plea deal, but it did. Yeah, bunch of groomers over there. No wonder they call everybody groomers, because they are. A Tennessee Republican praised Hitler for leading a life that got him in the history books. Well, so did Charles Manson. And tens of thousands of California grocery store workers approved a new contract with the major supermarket chains, and not a moment too soon, Easter is on Sunday. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where China said it would reject, quote, any pressure or coercion, end quote, to persuade Moscow to end the war in Ukraine. Wow. And they have a big old COVID epidemic uh, happening once again. Hmm. And concerned scientists and worried government officials probe a massive sea urchin die-off in the Caribbean. You know, sea urchins are the canary in the coal mine. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit.
near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link. And the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left of that chat room link across the page that, well, near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And you know what's coming. If you could become a recurring Patriot of Netroots Radio, and if you could afford to send us what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink, for instance, and yeah, if you could afford to send those funds to us once a month, it really does help us pay our bills. And the bills keep increasing, and we need the help. So if you could do that, it would be great. (laughs) Can you? Thank you. All right. And thank you to those of you who have stuck by us all these many years and helped us because uh, without you, we would not be able to do it. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. and We thank Tom for doing so. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary. Yes, it will be a diary, not a story. Um, about 10 minutes before showtime, that's automatic, but, uh, then I really try to scramble and get it up, linked up on Twitter and other social media platforms. So follow me there. And, uh, that way you can get the uh, show notes and links where the real reportage and the complete articles are. So follow me at justice Putnam for that. If you would like to follow the show, do so at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. And of course, now the deep archive of the Netroots Radio Library over all these 11 years can be found uh, at the Internet Archive at archive.org. Netroots Radio. Look for it. Alrighty, this uh, first offering in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on this fabulous Blue Moon Spirits Fridays comes from the American Independent by Nick Vachon. The Virginia Attorney General's Office and state Republicans have misled the public about a plea deal offered to a former sheriff's deputy who was condemned Convicted of attempting to solicit a minor for sex, according to court documents. On December 16th of 2021, Loudoun County Sheriff's Deputy Dustin Amos posted a message to Whisper, an anonymous social media platform reading, Keep this cop company at work today. Wow. Hundreds of miles away in Minnesota. An undercover detective who was conducting a sting operation saw the post. The detective struck up a conversation with Amos and posed as a 15-year-old in private messages with a sheriff's deputy. Well, I think in Virginia she's an old maid by then, isn't she? Well, let's get back to the article. At one point, Amos replied, 15, damn, you're young, but that's hot, with two T's even. Amos then began asking the undercover detective about her sexual preferences and sent a series of explicit messages, including a photograph of himself in his underwear. Oh, well. Later in the conversation, which continued for several hours, Amos told the detective, who repeatedly identified herself as a 15-year-old high school student, that she should travel from Minnesota to Virginia to meet him. You know, he could have had the defense that he was being entrapped. That's how it worked in Michigan with those guys trying to kill. Yeah, Whitmer, Whitmer, Whitmer. (laughs) Yeah, I'll get it out. The governor of Michigan. They were trying to kill her. Well, the sheriff's deputy continued messaging with the detective for five hours and at one point sent her a video of himself doing something in his car. And I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you know what it was. The detective identified the Nova DC Internet Crimes uh, Against Children Task Force the next day 
and state police arrested Amos outside the county jail where he was on duty. He was charged with two felony counts of soliciting a minor using using an electronic device and agreed to plead guilty to the first charge. If Virginia Attorney General Jason Meyer's office dropped the second charge. On March 24th, NBC4 Washington reported that Amos had accepted a plea deal from the Virginia Attorney General's office and on March 28th, the state politics newsletter Virginia Scope covered the story. In response, Victoria Lasavita, Meyer's director of communications, wrote an email to the newsletter's author, Brandon Jarvis, with the subject line, Correction Needed, in which she claimed the plea deal story was, quote, completely incorrect, end quote. There was no deal offered, La Savita offer or wrote on March 28th. There is a difference between pleading guilty and being offered a plea deal. They are not the same thing. This individual pleaded guilty to the charge without a disposition or plea deal, she wrote. Secondly, the investigation and analysis of this case, as well as the major decisions regarding what charges to bring, were made under former Attorney General Herring. But according to publicly available court documents, Paoletta signed a plea deal agreement with Amos and his attorney on March 3rd, long after Herring left office. Well, those details have not stopped Republicans in Virginia from denying that it was Meyer's own office that offered Amos a plea deal in that case. In response to a Virginia Democratic Party press release that cited NBC4's reporting, Republican Party of Virginia Chair Rich Anderson tweeted that it was, quote, reckless for Dems to traffic in partisan lies about plea deals with zero legal proof. They got the court documents, mofo. On March 27th, the Virginia GOP's official Twitter account posted a thread debunking the claims, which the party called, quote, another complete lie coming from the desperate Virginia Democrats. Last November, Republicans swept Virginia's elections for governor, lieutenant governor, and attorney general. During his campaign, Myers, a former state delegate, accepted $2.6 million from a Republican group that encouraged supporters to stop the steal by attending a rally outside the U.S. Capitol on January 6th of 2021. Myers and Virginia Republicans have also attacked Democrats for being soft on crime. Myers, in particular has targeted Democratic prosecutors' use of plea deals in criminal cases both as a candidate and as attorney general, which he argues are often excessively lenient. Oh, does hypocrisy have a name? Loudoun County was the center of one of the most contentious moments of last year's election. Three weeks before Election Day, the Daily Wire... A conservative news site revealed that a student at Loudoun County Public Schools committed two acts of sexual assault. The second, after having been transferred to a new school for committing the first. The father of one of the students said the school administrators had tried to cover up the assaults because the male offender, who was found guilty, was wearing a skirt and had entered a girl's bathroom to assault his daughter. During his campaign for Virginia governor, Glenn Youngkin seized on the cover-up allegations, promising he would direct Myers to open an investigation into the school district once elected. Soon after Youngkin and Myers won their respective races, Myers announced he would use his post to direct the Virginia Attorney General's office to investigate the Loudoun County Public School District. We're obviously aware of some pretty horrific cases, Myers said last November in an accent completely by my design. 
If there's anything that I want to bring back to the forefront in this process are the victims. So we can victimize them again? He added, when prosecutors are making plea deals on child rape cases over the objection of the family, I have a serious problem with that. Of course, Myers did not respond to an inquiry for this story. Singer of the American Independent brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. A Tennessee Republican state senator cited Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler as a positive example of someone who was able to make a life for himself after experiencing homelessness, even though Hitler never lived on the streets. Senator Frank Nicely yeah, nice name, used the example to voice his support for a Tennessee Senate bill that would criminalize encampments or soliciting on public property, making it a misdemeanor to camp, for example, under highways or bridges. The bill would provide for a $50 fine and a sentence of 20 to 40 hours of community service. No food, no place to sleep. you got to go out and pick up trash by the side of the road. Just don't sleep there. I want to give you a little history lesson on homelessness, nicely said in a speech on the Senate floor in support of the legislation and in another uh, belittling accent, totally of my own design. In 1910, Hitler decided to live on the streets for a while. So for two years, Hitler lived on the streets and practiced his oratory and his body language and how to connect with the masses and then went on to lead a life that got him in the history books. So a lot of these people, it's not a dead hand. They can come out of this, these homeless camps, and have a productive life, or in Hitler's case, a very unproductive life. I support this bill. What? Republican lawmakers seem to make a habit of praising Hitler. I like to say it. They don't seem to have any problem with their struggle with my struggle. And, of course, Hitler, whose regime engaged in systematic genocide that killed six million Jews and millions of political prisoners, disabled people, and members of other marginalized groups like the press. Representative Mary Miller, a repug from Illinois, said at a pro-Donald Trump rally the day before the January 6, 2021 uh, insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, Hitler was on the right thing. He said, whoever has the youth has the future. She later apologized. I don't know if it was in the accent that I would have used, and I just did. In January, a Republican state senator from Indiana came under fire when he said, Marxism, Nazism, fascism, I have no problem with the education system providing instruction on the existence of those isms. I believe we've gone too far when we take a position. We need to be impartial. What? The lawmaker, GOP state senator Scott Baldwin, later tried to clean up his remarks by saying, I believe that kids should learn about these horrible events in history so that we don't experience them again in humanity. Really? Tennessee Democrats condemned Nicely's comments. Tennessee Senator says Hitler made something of himself after being homeless, and you can too. I'm going to have to apologize to the universe for this guy. State Senator, or State State, Tennessee State Representative Gloria Johnson tweeted, adding that not a single day passes without Tennessee GOP embarrassing the hell out of our state. The SB 1610, the bill criminalizing encampments, ultimately passed in the Tennessee Senate by a vote of 22 to 10 and now heads to GOP Governor 
Bill Lee's desk for signature. Anonymous holiday staff, apparently, at the Associated Press, brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Tens of thousands of California grocery store workers have approved a new contract with the major supermarket chains, avoiding a potential strike. Union members in the central and southern areas of the state ratified a tentative deal that was reached last week. It grants some 47,000 employees higher wages, stronger health benefits, increased guaranteed hours for part-time workers, improved store safety, and a secured pension. The United Food and Commercial Workers International Union said in a statement, Most workers will receive pay hikes of $4.25 per hour, Over three years, the union said, with higher raises for some employees. The contract also includes provisions to establish health and safety committees at every Ralph's, Albertson's, Vaughn's, and Pavilion stores so that employees will have a say on safety issues. Frontline workers, including at grocery stores, were hit hard during the COVID-19 pandemic. After more than two years of risking their lives to serve California's communities as essential workers, reaching a fair contract with better wage increases, health care improvements, and protected pensions for these hardworking members could not have come at a more important time, said a statement by the seven union locals. All right. That's good news. Now let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, here's the deal. I keep hearing people call Morbius a Marvel movie when it's not. You see, superhero comics have been popular, beloved, and even great, but they haven't been consistently profitable. Hence, going into the 90s, Marvel was in deep, deep doo-doo, so they sold the film rights to some of their heroes. The Fantastic Four, Daredevil, and the X-Men went to 20th Century Fox, and they sold Spider-Man to Sony, who proceeded to turn out two and a half decent Spider-Man movies with Tobey Maguire. Meanwhile, Disney buys Marvel, Marvel Studios is born, and now Marvel makes movies, but without its mutants, which for the record I think has only helped them, and without its flagship hero. Fast forward to the 2010s, and Marvel Studios want Spidey back badly. Luckily, Sony's Andrew Garfield Spider-Man stumble birthed negotiations which led to Marvel Studios teaching Sony how it should be done with Tom Holland in Captain America Civil War. Today, Marvel Studios remains very hands-on with actual Spidey movies, but Sony owns the rights to the character still. And because, you know, money, they want to milk their property after its Marvel-helped successes, so they crank out Spider-Man adjacent movies, hence Venom, Venom and Carnage, and Morbius. Understanding this deal is important because there still remains a qualitative difference between a Marvel Studios film and a Sony movie. Morbius is your basic horror superhero hybrid. Arrogant, unsympathetic scientist turns himself into a monster, but we root for him because he accidentally 
accidentally creates a worse monster, and they stick the formula. Set up event, chase, fight, damsel in distress, woman in a refrigerator, showdown, fight, triumph, last moment reveal to tease the sequel, done. The thing is, when Marvel movies click, the formula is just a jumping off point for interesting themes and moving character moments. That's not Morbius. But it's fine, it's decent, it's just not, you know, marvelous. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. When you look up at the Milky Way, you're gazing at the galactic equivalent of Rome, a metropolis of stars with layers upon layers of history, just like the Eternal City. So says the astronomer Hans Walter Rix. There were glory days, there were disasters, and all of these things kind of happened in the life of galaxies. And the Milky Way is just one galaxy we can look at star by star, and so you can kind of see individual episodes in, in actual detail. Now Rix and a colleague at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Germany have indeed gone star by star, determining the ages of nearly a quarter million stars in the Milky Way. That work has allowed them to reconstruct some of the major life events in the galaxy's evolution over its 13 billion years of existence. What it showed is that indeed the youth and childhood of the Milky Way was turbulent, but actually afterwards we've lived an enormously sheltered life compared to most other galaxies. Gas drizzled in, and the suburbs grew peacefully and sprawled. The astronomers say that the galaxy's thick disk began to form around 13 billion years ago, just 800 million years after the Big Bang. Then, around 11 billion years ago, a cataclysmic collision occurred. The Gaia Enceladus satellite galaxy crashed into the Milky Way. And just at the same time, there was a huge burst of star formation or a large increase of star formation in our own Milky Way. And that suggests, doesn't prove, that the perturbance that this infalling satellite created caused a lot of gas that was in our Milky Way to form stars. The details are in the journal Nature. Now, none of this is a total surprise. People have simulated the Milky Way's formation before. So I would say really what our work has done is it just shows it clearly a long suspected picture is coming into focus. In other words, this work lays out a more definitive playbill of the acts in this galactic drama. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetrootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. The prize cases, which came before the Supreme Court in 1863, posed a constitutional test of President Abraham Lincoln's use of war powers during an emergency. On April 19, 1861, Lincoln had proclaimed a blockade of ports in the Confederate States. Four owners of ships seized by U.S. naval forces claimed the president had exceeded his executive authority under the Constitution by blockading seaports without a declaration of war by Congress. The court decided five votes to four against the petitioners and concluded that the president had constitutionally used his war powers in a moment of crisis to oppose an insurrection. Critics claimed that Lincoln's strong use of executive power to maintain national security had produced unconstitutional violations of individual rights. Lincoln perceived the paradox posed by his need to simultaneously exercise and limit his executive power in order to preserve the Union and its Constitution. Lincoln chose a course of action based on necessity which bordered on being too strong. If the government was too weak to achieve victory against insurgents, 
he believed the Constitution and the liberties it guaranteed might forever be lost. That's all for today's podcast. 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1947. It was opening day of a truly new baseball season. 14,000 black baseball fans had come to Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, making up more than half of the crowd. They let out an exuberant cheer as Jackie Robinson, the first ball player to break the color barrier, ran onto the field. But do you know what led to that historic moment? For years, black community leaders and writers at black newspapers had led the call demanding baseball's integration. The New York Trade Union Athletic Association also joined the fight. The TUAA organized sports programs for 300,000 union members. In 1940, they launched the committee to end Jim Crow baseball. That July, they hosted a labor sports carnival at the New York World's Fair. The theme for the event was ending Jim Crow baseball. Racially integrated teams played a series of baseball games. The committee collected more than 10,000 signatures to end baseball's long system of segregation. Civil rights and union leaders held pickets at baseball stadiums in New York and Chicago where they collected more than 1 million signatures. This grassroots community organizing brought attention to the racial barrier erected around America's pastime. Finally, their efforts paid off when the part owner and general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, Branch Rickey, signed Jackie Robinson to play for the Dodgers. Robinson often faced discrimination from other teams and fans during his career. But despite this harassment, he was named Rookie of the Year in 1947, National League MVP in 1949, and was named to the All-Star team six times. And so, each year on this day, Major League Baseball celebrates Jackie Robinson Day. Players wear the number 42 in honor of Jackie Robinson. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently... 29 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high again in the mid to low 50s. A mix of clouds and sun during the morning will give way to cloudy skies this afternoon. Winds light and variable. And then rain early tonight with snow overnight. Lows in the low 30s, winds light and variable. And then rain and snow showers in the morning tomorrow, becoming partly cloudy in the afternoon. Highs in the low 50s, winds out of the west at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then uh, Sunday, Easter Sunday, it looks like we might have uh, a bit of a drying out period, though it's only going to be in the mid 50s. And then we will have rain all next week, though the nights won't be so chilly that it will freeze but April showers, as they say, bring May flowers. Which reminds me, I should tell you, the grass pollen is rated low right outside the window here in Rogue River proper, which still has an impact. The air quality index for the region is good at 31 parts per million, and that daytime UV index has inched up in the moderate range to level 4. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.12 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles and relative humidity is at 97%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 71 degrees and sunny. 
Paris is 71 degrees and fair. Rome is 76 degrees and sunny. Kiev is 68 and cloudy. Kabul is 62 degrees and clear. Hong Kong is 73 and fair. Tokyo is 48 degrees and cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 65 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 45 degrees and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is a pleasant 61 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is Weather from Around the World, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Staff at the Associated Press bring us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. China said it would reject any pressure or coercion over its relationship with Russia in response to a call from U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen for Beijing to use its special relationship with Russia to persuade Moscow to end the war in Ukraine. Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijian defended China's position on the war, saying it had made considerable efforts to de-escalate the situation, defuse the crisis, and rebuild peace. Is it working? China playing a constructive role in the Ukraine issue, Zhao told reporters at a daily briefing. China has refused to condemn the invasion of Ukraine by strategic partner Russia or even referred to the conflict as a war in deference to Moscow, which uses the term special military operation. China has also amplified Russian propaganda about the war, including unsupported claims that the U.S. and Ukraine have been developing biological weapons. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Danica Koto of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Sea urchins are dying across the Caribbean at a pace scientists say could rival a mass die off that last occurred in 1983. Alarming many who warned the trend could further decimate already frail coral reefs in the region. Dive shops first began reporting the deaths in February, perplexing scientists and worrying government officials who are receiving a growing number of reports about dying sea urchins from islands and including Antigua, St. Lucia, Dominica, Jamaica, San Vincent, Saba, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, as well as Cozumel and Mexico. At first, the mortality event was linked only to black sea urchins, diadema and tellurium, which are recognizable by their extremely long, skinny spines. But two other species have been affected, including the rock-boring sea urchin and the West Indian sea urchin. It is very concerning, particularly because it's happening so quickly, said Patricia Kramer, a marine biologist and program director at the Atlantic and Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment, a scientific collaboration to improve reef conditions in the region. 
It, the deaths worry Kramer and other scientists, including Dana Mendez, uh, team lead for the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Coral Reef Conservation Program. Losing our sea urchins would be really devastating. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day and the week, but you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here on Monday for River City Hash Mondays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day, all night, and all weekend on this holiday, Easter holiday weekend, for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here on Monday, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver